Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. With the first pick, the Detroit Pistons select Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State University. Did Chandler again? Oh, what a block by Max Seal! My goodness! The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. There's Jaden playing the passing lane. Sky's a jam. Dunked and the crowd loves it. Pistons need a three and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. He's got it. He's got it. Chauncey Phillips hits the three. Overtime. Amazing. Out of bounds. Detroit Basketball. Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Blue Eve Network. I'm your host, Mike Angolano and joining me this week is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, buddy? Doing good, Mike. We've got some exciting Pistons news to talk about. You know, we were preparing for the show this week and we're recording a day early. We usually usually record Thursdays. We're recording on Wednesday night, but we were prepping for the show and we were like, oh, man, I mean, what are we going to talk about? Like, right. nothing really happened since last week's show. We're still kind of in this hold pattern to see what's going to happen between Kevin Ali or Charles Lee. And then we get the news drop from Sham Strania and the Athletic. So excited to talk about the update on the coaching situation. I think we have a fun little topic of discussion following that as well regarding a couple different players, a player the Pistons might be interested in trading for this offseason. And then we're gonna also going to do a little bit of a preview and prediction for the NBA Finals, which I think will be fun as well. So excited to get into all of that and more on this week's show. Absolutely. Boy, you're just kind of doing my job for me. This is this is great. I mean, all, all I'm really doing is, is reading the ad. And uh, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do right here. We'd like to thank our sponsor for this week's podcast, and that is Bet Online. And Bet Online is your number one source for all your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports for this year's NBA playoffs, which – now down to just the NBA Finals. But online is always your sports information headquarters this season. They've got you covered for all your sports wagering needs from basketball, MLB, NHL, hockey, right down to UFC and boxing. But online is the fastest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play right from your home. So head on over to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Be sure to use our promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V, to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use Bet Online again. That promo code is Believe, B L E A V, for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. And that report that you were alluding to was from the Athletic, Shams Rani of the Athletic, reported uh, early this afternoon, maybe late this afternoon, that the Pistons were making a final push to woo former Suns head coach Monty Williams to be the team's next head coach in Detroit. The money is pretty significant. I mean, it's clear that Monty Williams does not have significant interest in coaching any team, let alone the Pistons. Uh, he's already getting paid by the Phoenix Suns, so he technically doesn't have to. Uh, but reports are showing that this offer for Williams could be up to $10 million annually. That would put him right around Greg Popovich in terms of paid coaches, which I believe would make him the second highest paid coach in the NBA. I believe Pop makes eleven and a half million a year. And he's got quite the pedigree to deserve that eleven and a half mil. So he'd be one of the highest paid coaches in the entire league. Um, but the caveat to all this is that if Monty decides to rebuff the offer, which that's a lot of money, he'd be thrown away. And maybe he makes that next year uh, for the next coaching carousel or or makes more. Um, but if Williams doesn't take the offer from Detroit, the, the Athletics also reporting that Milwaukee Bucks assistant Charles Lee is likely to be the front runner for the job, usurping Kevin Ali as the supposed front runner. Uh, so... Some big news with the Pistons coaching hire. We talked about this last week. We we, we just want a, a decision. Uh, we just need a decision so that we could start to chart a course 
to determine what the Pistons are going to look like this offseason, what moves they're going to make, who they're going to be drafting. I mean, all this is important. So maybe that silence that we heard uh, after Monty Williams rebuffing Detroit the first time was paving the way for some of these bigger offers that we're seeing now. I mean, up to $10 million annually. That is pretty significant money for a head coach. Um, Aaron, what are your thoughts on the Pistons going and really pushing for Monty Williams? I think this is the right move. I think when you look at how this coaching search has, has played out for Detroit, it it, it hasn't gone well uh, in, in the public's eyes, and they need to find a way to get Monty Williams to to take their offer. You know, I know that I've seen a few people saying, "Oh, you're going to overpay to get Monty Williams to coach this team," and you know, I find that funny because overpaying is an interesting term to use when the money that the Pistons pay Monty Williams has nothing to do with the salary cap. So it doesn't affect anything that the Pistons can do roster wise or anything like that. Uh, You know, paying him $10 million a year, making him one of the highest paid coaching coaches in the league. Like that doesn't matter. Like, I don't know why people would get up in arms about Tom Gore's being willing to spend his money. Like that's just such a dumb thing to get upset about, you know, if you're concerned that something like Monty Williams getting a six year, $60 million contract and it doesn't work out. And then maybe Tom Gores is a little bit reluctant. The next time the Pistons have to hire a coach to spend big money because he's afraid it's not going to work out and he's going to be out of millions of dollars again, that'd be one thing. But this narrative are not a narrative, but the, the people that are saying, Oh, you're just going to overpay Monty Williams. I find that, hilarious because you're not this isn't this isn't a salary cap type thing you're not overpaying him this is tom gore's actually being willing to make a beneficial decision and being willing to spend money to get a a great coach a coach that is a coach of the year has coached in the finals has the winningest record among coaches since 2021 like this guy wins he is a player development coach He has an offensive philosophy predicated on making quick decisions, moving the basketball. Like this is the type of guy that you want taking over for a a young team, a rebuilding team, a team looking to take a leap. This is the exact type of coach that you want. You know, that's, it's not, it's not a, it's not easy to say that, that for someone like Kevin Ollie, who we, we didn't, you know, we, we don't have any, any track record of him, developing NBA players or developing a a program or anything like that. Like he was at UConn, he coached him how Calhoun's guys and then faded off into the sunset after that. Like we don't have that track record for him. It's easy to see how Monty Williams would fit into Detroit. And for a coach that has worked with just some elite, elite guards uh, across his career, not just in Phoenix, but in his past stops as well, like, whether as a head coach or an assistant coach, this is a guy that you that you want, and he'd be a. It seems like he'd be a hand in glove type fit of a coach for guys like Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey, your current two franchise pillars. So, to me, I think it makes all the sense in the world that Detroit's going hard after Monty Williams. If I'm Monty Williams, I'm not turning down generational wealth. Um, I get he's still making seven million dollars over the uh, annually over the next three years, but you tack on another forty, fifty million dollars, that's that's generational. That's that's your your children's grandchildren type money. Like we're talking a lot, a lot of money. And for as good of a coach as Monty Williams is, the Pistons have to hope that he does reconsider. And props to Tom Gore's for being willing to put that money out there, being willing to use the, those type of resources, because as I've stated before, Kevin Ollie was not going to be my top choice for the Pistons coaching position. And it doesn't seem like it was Tom Gores either. either. Yeah. We, we may have said a few times uh, over the last month or so that we are not the biggest fans of Kevin Ollie being the number one option. Um, we probably have mentioned it every single time uh, <laughs> that we've had a podcast that we'd rather see somebody else that's more player development driven. And 
Monty Williams certainly fits the bill while also being a coach that when Detroit is ready to knock on the playoff door, you can feel comfortable with him, you know, manning the team in, in that sort of setting. Um, you don't have a bridge coach. I mean, I think, I think a guy like Charles Lee, you know, he might be a bridge coach um, just to get the team on track and you give way to a vet, you know, in four or five years or however long that is. But I think Monty Williams would have some staying power. Um, the Pistons have a good young core. They've got the fifth pick in the draft. They have quite a bit of cap space and they have some higher expectations. And I think, you know, we talked last year about winning moves and how trading Boyan Bogdanovich is not a winning move from a t- from an organization that says they want to win. Tom Gore is going and reaching into his pockets and paying Monty Williams 50 or $60 million over five or six years. That is a winning move from an owner. So I'm all for this. I'm glad they're doing it. Even if they fall short in getting Monty Williams, the backup is Charles Lee, who we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast as well. Uh, He would be more in line of a player development type guy than Monty Williams and is less of a win now coach, but he sets a good foundation for this team as well. And I think Dwayne Casey set a good foundation as well. I mean, Dwayne Casey's been around a long time and I think the players really respect him and there's a reason he's staying with the organization, but Charles Lee sets the next layer of that foundation, which is we're going to win some basketball games. You know, we have, we have the camaraderie, we have the core, now let's start to put winning players in motion. Um, any thoughts on Charles Lee being the backup um, and not – well, actually, let's just talk about Lee first and not Kevin Ali. Let's let's talk about Charles Lee and how and how he, he fits as this secondary option for the Pistons. To me, you know, if I'm Charles Lee, I'm wondering how I'm feeling uh, if I'm sitting here – reading the news and then saying, well, if the Pistons can't get this guy that they're really, really pursuing, if you're Charles Lee, heck, if you're Kevin Ollie, you're sitting there and, and you've been a part of this process for well over a month. You've met with Troy Weaver, Tom Gores, the rest of the Pistons decision makers on numerous occasions. And now you're just kind of sitting here waiting to see if you can be the secondary choice. <laughs> You know, not that it sounds like these guys have other teams lining up to hire them, but at the same time, I think that's still, if I were in their shoes, something to be a little upset about. Now, maybe they understand that's the nature of the business and they're fine with that. But to me, you know, that's certainly how I would feel. But look, I think Charles Lee, for for what he's been around with in Milwaukee, uh, you know, being a part of different head coaching searches, being a part of a championship organization. Those are the type of things that that drew me to him out of the group that the Pistons ended up having further discussions with uh, as their coaching search progressed. He wasn't my top choice when, you know, all those initial names came out back directly after uh, Dwayne Casey was promoted to the front office. But out of the, the grouping, out of the three, uh, that made it to that that second and third round of interviews with the Pistons. Lee stood out to me because of the experience that he had uh, in Milwaukee, coming from a very strong coaching tree in Mike Budenholzer. It just made sense that he was ready to take the leap from what we've heard from, you know, the different times he's been a part of the coaching, uh, you know, candidate process. He's a guy that is expected around the league to be one of the next head coaches. And, you know, it takes time. It, it's not something that happens, uh, you know, in a year for a coach. Like, these guys grind for years and years and years. I mean, you look at Eric Spolstra, and you know his story if you follow the NBA closely enough. Started off as, you know, a, a film guy in Miami and, and rose the rank. So it, it takes time. And Charles Lee has seemingly paid his dues to where he's earned that opportunity So if Monty Williams does rebuke the offer, doesn't accept it, still decides to take a year off after the Pistons offer him $10 million a year to coach this team, I'd I'd be happy with Charles Lee at this point. I I think it's good that the organization has seemingly decided on Lee. If Williams doesn't take the offer, I, I think he's the right candidate. And again, we in the public, 
uh, I can't stress this enough. We don't have the insight into coaching candidates that people within the league in front offices as owners have. We do just, we just don't have that same insight and access, especially to these coaches that are assistants and we don't have an NBA head coaching, you know, history that we can go back and look at. So we don't know everything about Charles Lee, but from the public eye test, I think he has the right characteristics to be a, a future NBA head coach. And if it's with the Pistons, I, I would be disappointed that it's not, not Monty Williams, but I also wouldn't be disappointed that it's Charles Lee. Eric Swolcher, by the way, is tied for third in terms of highest paid coaches in the NBA, makes $8.5 million. Uh, he is tied with Doc Rivers. So that 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 did not go quite as well for Doc. It's Doc Rivers. I'm sorry. Future Phoenix Suns coach, Doc Rivers. Yes, future Phoenix Suns coach, Doc Rivers. Steve Kerr is second at nine and a half million dollars a year. Uh, he's got some championships, both on the court and on the sidelines, uh, that probably help to pump him up as the second highest paid coach in the NBA. Um, interesting. Mike Boonholzer, Nick Nurse. And Steve Nash round out the top five. Uh, don't have jobs anymore. Very interesting uh, to see that. You know, the coaching carousels whipped fast this year, I, much faster than I think in previous years. I don't remember an off season with so much coaching talent seemingly available from championship contenders. I mean, whether you believe the you know the Sixers were a championship contender or not. It certainly looked like it at points in the season. And obviously the Suns and Bucks were championship contenders, but the amount of coaching experience that is or was available this offseason is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and, you know, that might play into the calculus for Monty Williams if he feels like he's going to get an offer next offseason from another team that loses – maybe prematurely in the first round or 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 in the play in you know there there will be options available there to coach not that we don't obviously want him to come to Detroit but you know that that might be part of the decision making process for him is that hey these coaches are getting fired left and right and these aren't you know smaller named coaches these are these are I mean Monty Williams is a coach of the year candidate and a winner i uh, i mean it's 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 crazy so you know maybe a team like Dallas has a you know, a head coach opening next year. Maybe the Boston Celtics have a head coach opening coming up if, you know, if they falter or don't move forward with Joe Missoula. I mean, there there's a lot of options. So, you know, you have to wonder if that's that's part of the thinking for him is like, yeah, you know, I can make $7 million doing nothing. Um, and then next summer, when the coaching carousel, keep, you know, continues to spin uncontrollably, you know, he'll, he could get similarly high offers, um, and doesn't have to coach a rebuilding team like the Pistons. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. And I think it's a problem that, that the NBA is facing right now in terms of the volatility uh that, that coaches face across the league. We have coaches who are winning NBA championships in recent years that are getting fired. And I I just think it's crazy that a guy like Mike Budenholzer was fired this year. You know, for 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 someone like Doc Rivers, who had his chances in Philadelphia, right, had the South and, ropes, and the you know, and 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 he's had, he's demonstrated the inability to close series with the Clippers as well. I mean, he's a repeat offender of falling short. No, no doubt. But you know, guys like Boonholzer, guys like Monty Williams, even like, it's crazy that they just are are are. Bla- take the blame and take the fall when it's, it just cannot fully be on them. And for a team like Milwaukee, that's won a championship. And, and yes, this season for them was a failure. It, it didn't go as planned. They didn't get to where they needed to be like, no doubt about it. That's, that's, you know, an issue, but heck, what if the Denver Nuggets fired, fired Michael Malone a few years ago when Jamal Murray was hurt and this team could right. pumped like, they they've kept they've held on to Mike Michael Malone they've held on to Jamal Murray they've held on to you know 
uh, these other guys, and they've they've made smaller moves. Guys like Eric Gordon, they brought in right. Pablo Pope. You know, they didn't go out and and trade over and get rid of Michael Porter Jr. throughout his injuries. Like, there's there's something to be said about continuity, and for a team like Milwaukee, who who has winning experience and has the best one of the best players in the league. And, you know, it's going to be bringing him back. And it's just crazy to me the the volatility surrounding the coaching market right now. It feels like not everything can – not the, the blame can't just be put on the coaches, but they always do tend to take the fall. And I certainly don't think that coaches shouldn't get blamed. And I, I certainly don't think coaches shouldn't get fired if they're not living up to standards. But there are coaches who don't live up to standards like – Dwayne Casey, like Doc Rivers, and then there are coaches who, you know, there are there are situations that occur that cannot just be fully on the coaches. And when you have the history that these coaches have, it's 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 incredible to be incredible to me that franchises will fire them after you know a bad run in the playoffs. It's just crazy to me. So the Pistons hopefully can take advantage of of the Phoenix Suns here and their decision to get rid of Monty Williams and give him that offer that he just cannot refuse. Right. That's a good uh that's a good godfather reference too. I wish that Jasper was here for that. Make him an offer he can't refuse. Yeah, I wish Jasper would uh show up to the podcast sometime. That that sure would be cool, wouldn't it, Mike? Uh yeah. I mean odd, oddly enough, without Jasper, we also haven't been visited by uh Troy Weaver or Doc Rivers on the podcast. So it's a strange coincidence. I've never seen them in the same room works. together. <laughs> Crazy how that works. How odd, but you know, it's not just coaches that you know are, are are forced to be shaken up after a team fails to to meet expectations. It's also players, and boy, if you watched Game Seven of the Eastern Conference Finals between the Heat and Celtics, you would have thought that Jalen Brown was filling in for an injured player. He was pretty rough in Game Seven. I believe he had eight turnovers to. Miami's seven. I'll have I'll have to pull up the box score, but he's seemingly available. I'm I'm not entirely sure that he's uh, actually is available. I feel like Boston is going to continue to roll with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum as the you know the fulcrum of their team, but with Boston now eliminated, nearly came back. I saw a, a hilarious ESPN graphic that said Boston nearly did the unthinkable. And that's part of the reason why covering the NBA is difficult because you have major media corporations doing stupid crap like that. But they are now eliminated. The new CBA is coming into effect. That's going to make it more difficult for teams like the Celtics to keep two massive stars on max contracts. Look, Jasper put this on Twitter and was lambasted by people saying they'd rather have, you know, Bogdanovich or, or, you know, Cade is already better than Jalen Brown. I actually, I think Jasper said something along the lines of Jalen Brown being like the third option on this team um, or the second option. And people are saying that Cade is already better than Jalen Brown. That's nonsense. And maybe if you want to talk about it, we could talk about it, but there's no question about, the fact that Brown as a scorer, as a perimeter defender, and as a battle-tested playoff veteran, he is almost ideally what the Pistons need to make the playoffs. I mean, essentially. He fits the skill set that Detroit is severely lacking. Um, So there's been a lot of talk about potential trade packages. I mean, a combination of uh, of Ivy uh, Bogdanovich and the fifth pick, and you know potentially some other stuff to acquire Jalen Brown. First off, would you want to acquire Jalen Brown if the price is right? Because there has been some heinous things said of he's a bum, he disappears in the playoffs, he's not worth it. Let's be very clear that like a year and a half ago, every team was totally envious of Boston for having two wings who are that skilled in Tatum and Brown. And now all of a sudden one bad game in the Eastern Conference Finals. I I get it. It was on a big stage at a big moment, but it's still one game. 
he's still an all NBA caliber player when he's on. I don't understand. I mean, I know it's revisionist history and, and this is a, this is a league of what have you done for me lately? Uh, We don't look at the whole package of that player, but Jalen Brown is like the ideal player for the Pistons, right? Jalen Brown would be a great fit. He has some severe weaknesses that get exposed in the playoffs. No doubt about it. We've, we've seen it now for a few years and it, it was really noticeable in the Miami series, just like it got to be last year in the playoffs. But let's also not forget, this is an all NBA player, a 26 and a half point per game score. He can knock down three pointers. He is very, very athletic. Like, Yes, his weaknesses. He his handle is a problem. His handle is an issue. He is turnover prone. He does not he does not possess a great dribble, so he's not a great creator in that regard. But he does so many things that if he's playing in a role where he's not asked to be a main ball handler and he gets to pick on weaker opponents, like this is a guy that is an incredible talent, a top 25 player in the league still. And, you know, it's all about if the price is right, obviously. I, I don't know what Detroit has that, that gets a package done to, to get Jalen Brown. I don't even know if Boston wants to trade Jalen Brown. Now, I know that the talked about package, the, the you know, trade, mach- trade machine package on, on Twitter has been Jaden Ivey, Boyan Bogdanovich, the fifth pick, and then whatever other salaries necessary to, to get the deal done. And, and then when you look at it at that level and you break it down like that, and you get into the weeds of what actually has to go out in order to get this guy in, that's when I can say, okay, let's slow down here and let's look at the type of impact this trade would have. You know, if I'm Boston and then I look at the the playoffs that I just had, I'd say that, that might actually help us because we saw what Jalen Brown did for us and maybe the 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 tiering of, of Brown and Tatum just isn't perfect, the fit isn't perfect, Maybe we just need some more solidified shooting. We'd be getting in another guard in Ivy who is, you know, electric and can do some more of the ball handling while still being a, more of a scoring threat than guys like Marcus Smart or Derek White. But we'd also be getting Bogdanovich, who's a knockdown shooter, you know, can pick on some mismatches that's mismatches in his own regard. Uh, you know, kind of like Brown, doesn't have the greatest handle, but he doesn't do try to do as much with the ball. Uh, that Jalen Brown does try to do. And again, would just be a a much better shooter, floor spacer to have on the court. And they get that fifth pick that they can spend on, you know, whatever type of of player that they they think that they want. And Detroit kind of has to look at it in that regard as well. What are they getting in? And is it worth what they're losing in, in that deal? And when you talk about that specific of a trade package for someone like me, who's super, super high on Ivy and, you know, it's definitely has talked a lot about how much I like, Boyan Bogdanovich and you're throwing in a top five pick in the draft like that is a lot for a guy who did get exposed and those two guys that the Pistons would be trading out are you know two of the only small handful of pieces that this Pistons team really does have to build around right now you would be giving up that would be a considerable price to trade for Jalen Brown but I also don't think the deal gets done uh, with a, a lesser package I mean you look at the the cost of these all-star all NBA level players and the prices numerous first round picks, you know, established pieces, you know, the Donovan Mitchell trade is obviously the one that's, that's going to get brought up nowadays because of just how much that Utah, uh, you know, got in return for Donovan Mitchell from Cleveland. We'll talk about the Rudy (laughs) Bear trade as well. I like Jalen Brown. I don't know how the Pistons make a trade like that work because I, I, I think there's, that Jaden Ivey is a vital piece for them moving forward, and I'm super high on him. And, and if you're not including Cade Cunningham or Jaden Ivey, I just don't see a path to getting Jalen Brown, albeit he's a hell of a player despite his struggles versus Miami. He does a lot of great things, and obviously after a bad series, people are going to talk about his weaknesses, as they should, but let's not forget how talented of a player he is, and he would, ascend, he would be the best player in the Pistons. They won by far, no questions asked. See, I think you were you were doing a pretty um, reserved opinion of that, but I think you just ended with what's going to cause some people to be angry, and that 
I think there are people that feel like Cade Cunningham is better than Jalen Brown right now. Long. The 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 common sentiment, I don't disagree with you, but the common sentiment was if you put Cade Cunningham on that Boston team right now and you replay game seven, the Celtics do not lose game seven. I think that's the measuring stick for some of these people that How oh Cade, you- I I I don't know. Like that's just a I, lot of I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, we haven't seen Cade Cunningham play basketball since November of 2022. Like, how can he's you played 76 games in two years? That's just great. And I love Cade. Like, I think Cade Cunningham is going to be a great player. I think he can. He's awesome. Have a better career than Jalen Brown, no doubt about it. He can. He he can be a better player than Jalen Brown at some point in his career, but he's not right now. He that's just. I, no. His potential is is higher. If you want to say that, maybe in two years. Why? Well, yes, I think the ceiling is much higher for Cade Cunningham. Yes. But in a vacuum right now, I, I I don't know how you can justify that in your mind other than you watched the game and you watched Jalen Brown dribble the ball like, you know, a newborn deer uh, that's trying to walk and, and, and just looks totally out of place and gets his pocket picked. If you really hold that in super high regard, I mean, there are other things that Jalen Brown is very good at. And I pulled up his – cleaning the glass stats just out of curiosity. And you mentioned point guard, Derek White and Marcus Smart. And I think that is part of the problem for Jalen Brown and too much of having to create when he very clearly does not have the handle that's good enough to do that. Um, He shot career lows in three-point percentage and career lows in corner threes. He shot 29% from the corner he shot 35 percent the year before and 41 percent the year before that um he was in the sixth percentile for corner threes uh which is just a hair above johnny davis coveted washington wizards pick johnny davis so i mean you're you're looking at a guy that had a had a bad shooting season from deep um his middies were fine and he was shooting fine at the rim but he, he was not as good of a three-point shooter so the history's there, though, of him being a very good scorer, of being a very good defender. I mean, Boston has one of the better defenses in coaching, certainly plays that, into that a lot, but he is a very good defender as well. If bullet your head right now, I mean, are you trading Ivy Bogdanovich in five for Jalen Brown right now? No. And it's tough because, like I said. It is tough. I, think I don't think I would do it either. Player. I, I really, really do. And it's easy to pick on a guy after a bad series. But I just can't do it if I'm Detroit because I am super strong on Jaden Ivey. Uh, I, I really, really like what what he's what he showed in this, specifically in the back half of the year and how that's going to mesh with Kate Cunningham when he's healthy. I think having Bogdanovich is it's just an easy piece. You don't have to worry about his production. You right. Know you get out of it. Plug and play. Seamless fit. No matter what type of lineup you have on the court, like, and then the fifth pick, like, and I'm a guy that's not super high on this draft. I, I don't love any of the prospects that are supposed to be there at five, but it's still a top five pick. And there is still extreme value to that pick. And, you know, if the Pistons didn't have to give up Ivy and they didn't have to give up Cunningham and there was another way to get, you know, Jalen Brown, Bogdanovich in the fifth pick, you know, if that was enough, obviously – I would do that. Oh, call it in. But when you talk about Jaden and Ivy, who's a top, you know, a top five pick from last year's draft, you're talking about another top five pick from this year's draft and a 20 point per game scorer in, in Bogdanovich. It just, as, as much as I like Jalen Brown, I just think it's going to be easier for Detroit to get to where they need to be sooner. If they hold on to the few good players that they have and, and try to build out from there, because I, I really am high on Jaden and Ivy, and I think the pairing of of Cunningham and Ivy is is really really strong. And you you add in Jalen Dern, you add in Boyan Bogdanovich. Yes, this team does still have some severe flaws and some 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 severe holes that they have to fill across the roster. But those four guys, you know, we've talked about. They need to get a wing. Like if you could add Jalen Brown to that group, that would be great. But you're just not going to be able to do it and right. keep those those guys that we just mentioned. Yeah, and no, I agree with you. I mean, there there is a time to make a condensing trade. 
We just saw the Cavaliers do it. They condensed their pieces to get Donovan Mitchell and in the regular season that worked out great. Um, there, there is a time to make a condensing move for a star. I don't know if the Pistons are at the point yet where they need to do that. And Jalen Brown, I don't, I, I don't want to say he's not worth it, but I don't think that, you know, you want Ivy and Cade with Brown because that lessens his need to handle the basketball. We just saw Jay and Ivy perform very well, uh, basically as the de facto point guard with Cade out. I think you need an, that other ball handler with Brown out there to continue to create space for the offense. So I feel like slotting him in as the second guard or as like a, as really right next to Cade, I, I I think you run back into the same problem that he has in Boston, which is handling the basketball too much to the point where he creates turnovers. So I, I don't think I do Ivy Bogdanovich in five either. It's going to be a very interesting off season for Boston um, because they are going to run into some CBA problems down the line. If you're going to give a max to Jalen Brown, and then you're, you're going to be put into a very difficult position when you're trying to round out the rest of the roster. So it, it'll, it'll be very interesting, but I like the idea of Jalen Brown on the Pistons. You just have to see how his market shakes out um, as, as we get a little deeper into the off season. But speaking of Boston and really the team that they lost to the Miami heat, who lost the first game of the play in crazy. And now they are in the NBA finals uh, with a historic run through the Knicks, through Milwaukee, and now through the Boston Celtics. I mean, two championship contenders, and they downed them both. They won three games on the road in the Eastern Conference Finals. What and what the hell? I uh, have no idea how that can possibly happen, but it, it just did. And they'll play the Denver Nuggets, who've quietly dispatched pretty much every opponent they faced. They didn't flinch at... Durant and Devin Booker and the Phoenix Suns. They didn't flinch at all playing LeBron James and Anthony Davis and the Lakers. And obviously they didn't flinch against the Milwaukee or uh, against the Minnesota Timberwolves. They've just kind of quietly hummed along, taken down their opponents. And now they're going to play the Miami heat in the NBA finals. So let's talk a little bit about the finals as we wrap up this podcast. Aaron, I, I I think it's Nuggets in five or six. I'm going to go with six because I'm too scared to say five because that's too bold for me. That's why I don't bet on sports too, too often. But when I do, I use bet online. But five is a little bit too uh, too rich for my blood. Six seems pretty safe. Um, who do you have winning the finals? I'll say it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll be the person. I, I have Denver winning this in five. Uh, this is a... A team that's been playing phenomenal, phenomenal basketball. Don't want to take anything away from Miami. What they've done, against all odds, they have come out of every series on top. This is a team in Miami that's been playing, you know, since the playing in April where they, they're playing essentially every other day. You know, you get those, those at the beginning of the playoffs, you get those series where you get two, three, you know, two days off or sometimes even I think three days off in between a game here or there. But once you get down to the nitty-gritty and you're playing these seven-game series, you're playing every other day and at this point Miami has they 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 look tired by the end of that Boston series no doubt about it and now they're going into Denver they've got two games in the Mile High City to start this off there's been a lot of noise a lot of talk about the the altitude and how that's going to affect this series and and I think it does truly affect the series and for a Miami team that's been playing so much I I just think unfortunately for them they're running into a bus off they're playing Mm -hmm. the best team in the league who has the best player in the league and a team that's that matches up very, very well against them. Denver ranked, you know, for top as a top team offensively against his own defense in both the regular season and in the playoffs. That's sort of Miami's bread and butter that they throw out against teams to, you know, mix them up. But Denver just has the right stuff to beat that as they've shown all year. And Nikola Jokic should have been the MVP for the third year in a row. He's, just has a great track record against Bam Adebayo uh, as well. I think Miami has, you know, had a great season. I don't want to take away from what they've done, but I also think Denver just has the right roster. You know, I think they've got enough guys defensively to throw at Jimmy Butler, Aaron Gordon, Bruce Brown, Contavious Caldwell-Pope. 
Jamal Murray is a star in his own respect. I think we're going to be looking back in a few years and saying, how the hell did Jamal, Jamal Murray never make an all-star team? Like he is so, so good. And he's had so many, you know, so many big injuries that have kept him out for so long. And it took him some time this year to get his confidence back. And that's been a big storyline for him and for the Nuggets. But he has been so, so special. And, and he's had some big moments in the playoffs, uh, you know, this year. He's had it in the past as well. He's such a talented player. I, I just think that this Denver team's a bust saw right now. It feels like it's their year. And I, I just think that there's too many factors. The rest that they have, uh, I think they're going to take this, take this pretty easily. Gentlemen sweep style, Nuggets in five. You know, the best opportunity for Miami to make their statement is to come out adrenaline rushing after going into Boston, beating the Celtics, and taking game one. I think it's going to be a very extra important game one because Denver's kind of been waiting. They swept the Lakers. Denver's been healing up and waiting. The Heat have been battling every night, nearly blew a 3-0 lead. I think that first game is going to be very interesting. You know, you have a team that is more talented in the Denver Nuggets against a team that has been more more, more recently battle-tested in, in the Miami Heat. I would not be surprised if Miami comes out and wins, but I would be surprised if they win this series. You know, they're just running into so much talent. But Boston had a whole bunch of talent too. I mean, they they maybe were just not built for the moment. They're certainly not playing anybody like Nikola Jokic, and they haven't up to this point. Um, nobody even remotely close. Um, he just has total command of the offense just completely. I mean, some of the passes he was making against the Lakers, insane. The the pockets he finds, the, the lanes that he finds, the footwork that he, he has down in the post is just outrageous. And it's going to be a big test for Bam Adebayo as well. I mean, I, I mean this is a, you know, it's, it's one thing to face Al Horford and, Robert Williams, who was apparently so sick he was throwing up every couple of minutes um, in Game 7. You know, it's it's one thing to play those guys, and those are good players. Nikola Jokic is a monster. Uh, you know, he's he's going to bring you out, out of the paint and try to orchestrate offense that way. You know, he's, he's going to do some things that Bam has not seen yet. So it, it'll be... It'll be a big test on the inside. And Bam certainly has the tools to slow him down. But it's going to be very interesting, um, the center battle between these two teams. What do you think about, because I'm now looking at the Denver Nuggets uh, roster, which, by the way, they were 15th in defensive rating. We'll have to go back and look. But there was a point uh, where every NBA champion had a top 10 defense for like in nine out of the last 10 years or something ridiculous like that. The Nuggets are, are fifth in offense. They were 15th in defensive rating this past year. I mean, it only matters in the playoffs, and I and I get that. But, um, you know, it, it's going to be a very good series. I know that the NBA, I'm, I'm sure, is unhappy that they, you know, narrowly missed Celtics-Lakers and NBA Finals and all of the money and whatnot. But, you know, this is a, this is a very good series uh, with – very different play styles and very exciting players. Jimmy Butler is an exciting player. Nikola Jokic is an exciting player. These are two very, very good teams. Yeah, if you're now, not excited, Bruce Brown, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you're not excited for this matchup, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, I, I just think you don't really like basketball if you're not all like if you're not it's excited. Very possible. Not, it's like Denver is an elite, elite team. And they have one of the best players in the league. Jimmy Butler is a top 20 player in this league. These are two very, very good teams. And the storyline is amazing for Miami. They're defying the odds. They are on an historic run. Like, how could you not be interested in this? Just because right. it's not Steph Curry and Golden State? Just because it's not LeBron James? Like, I mean, I, I think it's crazy. Now I get the markets are bigger for, for Boston and Los Angeles and Golden State, I, I I get that, but these are still two very, very good teams with two very, very big names in the game. 
for those that, that watch the NBA, you know, on a regular basis. And hell, Jimmy, Jimmy Butler's been around a while. Like, you should know who Jimmy Butler is, and you should understand how good he is. Like, oh yeah, I get that, you know, these teams don't have the stars of uh, uh, of some of these other teams. But, my goodness, two great storylines. A team in Denver that has stuck it out with their coach, with their core, the storyline of their, their best player being a, a second-round draft pick whose pick was announced in the middle of a Taco Bell commercial on NBA Draft. Wow. It's amazing. Two-time MVP, being one of the best players in the game. So them sticking it out year after year, having disappointing injuries limit their seasons, limit their playoff runs, for them to finally be in this position against an eight seed doing what's really never been done before almost uh, in in what Miami is doing. I think it's an incredible storyline. I'm stoked for this matchup. Oh, yeah. Yep. It'll be a great series. It stings a little bit to see Bruce Brown Contavious Caldwell Pope, uh, Reggie Jackson. Uh, let's see who else this is goes on, on and on, my friend. Ish Smith, although he's played for half the league. Piston legend DeAndre Jordan. Yeah, and, well, at least he's being paid by the Pistons. It's yeah. <laughs> Oh, don't get me started on that. I we could do a whole other podcast on 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 that. So let's. I I, I shouldn't start on. Bruce Brown and, and so no, no, no. It'll, it's it, it just going to twist the knife. Right. Let's just, I guess just one more quick thing uh, and then we'll wrap up. I was having this discuss with some of uh, my fear, the sword writers and um, you know, you had mentioned Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, uh Caleb Martin, some of those fringe roster guys who are rotation pieces, but they're not, you know, they're not six men of the year candidates. Those players led Miami to the finals, essentially. I mean, in the aggregate, when you have a bench and role players who understand their role on this team and they play it as well as they did, that's invaluable. Invaluable. And, you know, we had talked about this because the Cavs went very high end. Uh, young core with Allen and Mobley and Mitchell and Darius Garland, and the bench was pretty much non-existent. The role players were not there. They did not play their role the way that they needed to. The Jetty Osmonds, the Karis Levert, well, Karis was okay. And I think that that's that's a teachable or you know an an important consideration when you're roster building, like the Pistons are. Is you are going if if you are want to be successful and win playoff series, you can't just have two guys running the, you know, running the show, and that that has been more apparent now more than ever with Miami squeezing every bit of basketball out of Gabe Vincent and Kayla Martin. Kayla Martin has better <laughs> NBA Finals MVP odds than Michael Porter Jr. Insane. No. Nobody would have guessed that. I mean, my what Miami's getting out of these guys is is a testament to their coaching staff. It's a testament to the culture. It's a testament to you know the way that the leaders of the team have empowered these guys. I mean, I, I know that the storyline around Miami and the storyline around these players is these undrafted guys that are are pulling, you know, making these plays and having these performances and this big these big so these bigger moments. Like it's it's nothing short of incredible and they have answered every door that's been knocked on for them. Uh, again, I think that's what makes this, this matchup so intriguing is if this, this inconceivable run that this team and these players are on can continue against just an absolute buzzsaw of a team right now in Denver. Caleb Martin was cut by the Charlotte Hornets. They cut, the, they cut the wrong twin. <laughs> You're right. They did. So, I mean, I, I just wanted to highlight that because, you know, we're going to talk a lot about roster building throughout the season and looking at what pieces fit. And, you know, hey, ask the Brooklyn Nets with Harden and Durant and Kyrie Irving and then just stuff at the bottom with very little culture and they just hope that, you know, that enough talent will will do it. But the role players 
I mean, even Contavious Caldwell Pope played great in Game Seven against the Los Angeles Lakers. Played very well. These players matter. I mean, yes, of course, you want to lock down your studs and, and your core, but Bruce Brown is awesome. Aaron Gordon is a non-shooter who knows exactly when he needs to shoot and has knocked down shots. Jeff Green is still playing. I mean, you, it's that. just very good vets. I mean, Denver. And, what Denver can do is, you know, I, I heard Michael Malone talking about this uh, on a podcast earlier today he's like you know our team's great because we just have guys that are, are willing to accept the role that they're in and talked about Contavious Caldwell Pope and Aaron Gordon sitting uh in I think it was game two against the Lakers when they went to Bruce Brown and Jeff Green who were playing great and you know Gordon and, and KCP ended up sitting like the entire fourth quarter because Green and Brown were playing so well and it's like he's like you know these guys didn't go into the locker room and, and were moping because they, you know, didn't get to get back in the game and got, you know, sad over other players. Like they were the first ones up cheering, chanting, celebrating, like being a part of this moment with the team. And it's like, that's a testament to the depth. That's a testament to the roster that's been put together there. Like Denver's an incredible storyline uh, just as much as Miami is. And, and these rosters, the, the different players that, have developed over the years and are still sticking around. Like, I just think it, it makes for such an intriguing matchup. It does. And, it, and if you're not uh, interested in, in this matchup, then I would really consider tuning in. Um, Cause this is a very interesting matchup. I mean, it's definitely going to be worth your time to watch these two teams battle it out. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. You have two of the best players in the league playing at their best. Should make for some very good television. I know I will be tuning in uh, for sure. And I know that my co-host Aaron Johnson will be doing so as well. And our invisible co-host Jasper Apollonia is not here. Um, Maybe he'll be on a podcast eventually. I don't know. Dylan was pretty good. Yeah, Dylan was pretty good. People did like Dylan. People like Dylan. (laughs) Um, Aaron, anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up this edition of the Palace Pistons podcast? No, I mean, I'm excited for the finals. I, I hope by next week we're able to to have the, the coaching search finalized and the Pistons locked into whoever their next head coach is going to be because, my God, it's it's June, folks. The draft is here. Our agency's right around the corner. Like, decisions have to be made, and it would sure be nice to have a head coach around uh, to be a part of that process. So hopefully by next week we're talking about a finalized hire moving forward into the draft talk because I'm excited about that. I, you know, we haven't talked a ton about the draft. We haven't talked about the possibilities of trading the pick a, a ton. So excited to get into all that. And the Pistons have a second round draft pick, the 31st pick in the draft. We'll certainly be talking about prospects for, for them to be looking at uh, with that draft spot as well so super super excited to kind of move into this next phase uh, of the off season for the Detroit Pistons and we're very excited to have all of you along with us as we go through this off season together we've we've hounded on it a lot it's an important off season for Detroit and uh, you know we're very we're very excited to cover it and we're even more excited to have all of you listeners um alongside us uh hopefully enjoying the content. Um, and speaking of content, we do have written content. We are going to have position reviews up on the website. We'd like to have some other people come on and talk about those positional reviews. Dylan was on last week, talked about the guards. We're going to be talking about uh, the bigs as well. Uh, and we're going to be talking about forwards. So very excited to have all this content coming down the pipeline, both written and on the podcast. But uh, yes, we are going to be getting into it on the podcast. Very excited. The draft will be really interesting. There is so much potential movement uh, outside of Victor Wembanyama at one. Um, and we hope that you'll be joining us along the way as we get to cover it. So for my co-host, Aaron Johnson, I am Mike Anguilano. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. So we'd like to thank our sponsor for this week's podcast. Once again, Bet Online. you could head on over to the website, Receive your 50 cent welcome bonus on your first deposit using the promo code BLEAV. That's B L E A V. Once again, thank you, Aaron, for joining me on this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, and we will see you all next time. <laughs> <laughs>